In this segment of the class, what I would like to do is take a look at the sort of geography of the death penalty and most importantly, the historical factors that led to that. Uh, there's a lot of information about the death penalty available uh, on the uh, website of the Death Penalty Information Center, which is uh, www.deathpenaltyinfo.org. Uh, I would refer you to that for things like which states have the death penalty, which states don't, uh, how many people are on death row in each state, how many executions, all of that sort of information is collected there. Uh, there's also evidence, uh, or excuse me, information about uh, some of what we will be talking about over the uh, course uh, at uh, secondclassjustice.com. Uh, but I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, first, to look at executions by regions. Uh, in the United States. As we can see, and this is since 1976, as I said, the death penalty was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1972 in the case of Furman versus Georgia. 1976, the Supreme Court upheld the death penalty, at least of some states, uh, and so we really measure the modern death penalty by what's happened uh, since 1976 under the new statutes that we'll be talking about in the next session. Um, uh, since that time, this is from 1976 until the end of 2012, uh, as you can see, over a thousand executions in the South, uh, only 155 in the Midwest, 82 in the West, and, and only four uh, in the Northeast. Uh, if we look at the states uh, that have carried out over 50 executions since 1976, we see Texas uh, by far and away, almost 500 at the end of 2012. Only two other states over 100, Virginia and Oklahoma, uh, and then uh, other states uh, that have, uh, are above uh, Georgia 52, Alabama at 55, Missouri uh, at 68, and Florida at 74 uh, that are above that level. Uh, this is an interesting uh, way to look at how the death penalty is imposed in the United States. This is less than 1% of all the counties in the United States. In fact, it's less than 1% of the counties uh, in states uh, that have the death penalty. I mean, here's another way to look at it. All of the counties in red are Texas counties, uh, and you see out of the top 10, only Oklahoma City and St. Louis County, Missouri, uh, are, are in the highest number of counties. Uh, and then when we get to the last five, we do have counties from Arizona, Ohio, Alabama, two Alabama counties there. Well, what, what's the reason for the fact that so many of these executions are in the South, that our largest death rows are in the South, uh, well, uh, part of the reason is slavery. Uh, the uh, fact of the matter was uh, the time of uh, slavery in this country, uh, the southern states had to deal with a captive population. There was always a threat of some sort of slave revolt or organizing of slaves. Uh, in three of the southern states, there were actually more Africans in slavery than there were white people. So it was a very delicate uh, situation in terms of uh, controlling uh, these people and as a result uh, a number of uh, death penalty provisions applied uh, to slaves and even freed slaves. Many capital statutes uh, applied uh, only to blacks uh, whether slaves or, or free uh, and uh, of course in colonial times when the country uh, first started uh, we didn't have any prisons. Uh, the only way you punish people was by killing them uh, cutting off their fingers, branding them, uh, whipping them, which was a, a punishment at that time, putting people in stocks. Uh, any of those punishments today would seem pretty primitive, uh, but the one that we still have uh, is the death penalty. Uh, a lot we will see in the northern states, uh, uh, once prisons became available, a great decline in the use of the death penalty. Uh, but that was not the case in the south, and the reason for that uh, was uh, slavery. Uh, what the northern states did was uh, move away uh, from uh, the death penalty. In fact, uh, even before the Civil War, Michigan in 1946, uh, later Rhode Island and Wisconsin abolished the death penalty altogether. But in the other northern states, the death penalty was increasingly limited only to murder cases, homicide cases. Uh, whereas in the South, uh, although the legislatures did away with the death penalty for some crimes against uh, excuse me, yeah, cr uh, crimes committed by whites, uh, it was still used for all sorts of crimes um, against black people uh, because it was seen as indispensable to managing two million people who were in slavery. Uh, and so uh, even distributing leaflets was a capital crime in Louisiana uh, 
uh, as well as all sorts of other crimes like burglary, uh, larceny, robbery, uh, rape, of course, was a, was a capital crime, and many people were uh, either lynched or sentenced to death for, uh, for lynching. So that resulted in the end of the war comes, and uh, the southern states still have capital punishment, and it becomes even more important, perhaps, uh, after uh, uh, the war. Uh, the Supreme Court, excuse me, the uh, Congress passed uh, the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution providing that no state would de de deny any person the equal protection of the law. This was adopted in 1868. Uh, and the hope of this was that the free blacks in the South would be protected uh, by federal enforcement under the Equal Protection Clause, and that the state would. It said no state shall deny any person the equal protection of the law. However, that didn't uh, really last too long. Uh, not long after the Colfax Massacre in, in Louisiana, where a group of black people who had been deputized were holed up in the courthouse. Uh, they were attacked by whites. A number of the blacks were killed. Uh, very few people were prosecuted, but one of the uh, prosecutions made its way to the Supreme Court of the United States uh, and the court said you can't prosecute this because the amendment says said, no state. Well the people who attacked the courthouse were not the state, it was a mob. Uh, it was Ku Klux Klan uh, basically uh, and so the clause was interpreted in a way that actually protected the Ku Klux Klan uh, rather than holding the local officials responsible uh, for not having uh, enforced uh, the law and protected the people at the courthouse. But the case that really uh, caused the most damage was one that came a little later, United States versus uh, Reese, uh, which involved some people in Kentucky who were refusing to register black people to vote. Uh, and they were prosecuted for that. And the Supreme Court, United States versus Reese, uh, said, uh, well, you not only have to show that they intended to do that, but that their motive was race. Now this is a very difficult thing to prove. In all criminal prosecutions, generally you uh, prove intent, that a person intended the national, uh, natural and probable consequences of their action. But proving why someone acted, did they act for racial reasons? This, as we will see all the way through the course, uh, becomes a tremendous hurdle to enforcing uh, or preventing racial discrimination uh, from taking place uh, in the criminal courts. Um, after uh, the Civil War, of course, uh, lynching, uh, terrorism uh, became uh, quite common as a way to preserve white supremacy, as a way to keep the newly freed slaves in pretty much the, uh, the bondage that, that they had been in. Uh, this uh, phenomenon and the fact that it happened so much inspired uh, Billie Holiday uh, to uh, perform uh, this song. Uh, strange fruit. Not a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eye. And the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit. For the crows to pluck 
for the rain together. Strange Fruit was written by uh, Abel Maripol under the name Lewis Allen. Uh, Billie Holiday performing this song brought a lot of attention uh, to lynching, uh, as did the work of Ida B. Wells and the uh, NAACP, uh, as this was happening uh, so frequently uh, during this time period. Uh, Strange Fruit actually made it to uh, the 16th place on the charts uh, in music in uh, 1939. Uh, it, the, this is an execution or this uh, hanging of uh, Reuben Stacy uh, in Florida, and I just offered to show the little girls uh, dressed up in their Sunday best who are here uh, watching uh, this lynching in Fort Lauderdale, Florida uh, in 1935. Uh, often lynchings were uh, somewhat of a carnival type event with families coming and people bringing picnics and all of those sorts of things. A lot of the leading citizens uh, there uh, but almost no prosecutions. Almost every report of a lynching would say uh, that it was conducted uh, at the hands of uh, parties unknown, uh, even though it had all been public and everybody knew exactly uh, who had, had been participating. This lynching here is of uh, 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 Jesse Washington in Waco, Texas. 15,000 people uh, were there for it. Uh, in the readings that accompany uh, the class, there's a lot more information both about lynching and about the efforts to end it by Ida B. Wells and the NAACP and, and others and some statistics about it uh, from the Tuskegee Institute, uh, which, which started monitoring uh, lynchings. Uh, the point uh, worth mentioning here is that Congress never passed an anti-lynching act. Uh, even when President Truman asked for it, uh, Congress didn't pass an anti-lynching act. Even though this terrorism was going on, and you look today when we pass terrorism acts without a uh, great deal of thought going into them, perhaps. Uh, over and over again, it was, uh, uh, efforts were made to pass anti-lynching laws, uh, but the Southern senators, led by Richard Russell of Georgia, uh, would always oppose them, uh, and always oppose them under the guise of the Constitution, federalism, states' rights, a lot of the arguments that we're going to hear all through the course with regard to uh, the role of the federal governments in reviewing uh, capital cases. Uh, and so forth. Uh, these two lawyers are worth mentioning as people who stand out in the history of, of this troubled time, uh, Noah Pardon and, and Stiles Hutchins. Uh, Ed Johnson was uh, convicted of a crime of rape in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. These two African-American lawyers had somehow managed to have a successful law practice in Chattanooga, Tennessee at the turn of the century, at around 1900. Uh, somehow they were uh, succeeding in that. Uh, Ed Johnson's father comes and talks to Noah Pardon about taking uh, the case of Ed Johnson. Uh, he goes to his partner, Stiles Hutchins. They have to know that if they take this case, nothing is ever going to be the same again. Uh, and yet Stiles Hutchins says, uh, to us much has been given and much is required. They take the case. Noah Pardon goes to Washington, argues before Justice Harlan, obtains a stay of execution. Uh, mob that night breaks into the jail, takes Ed Johnson out, hangs him over the bridge there in Chattanooga, the river that goes through town, riddles him with bullets. Uh, and just a short time after that, uh, Noah Pardon and Stiles Hutchins had to close their law practice and leave Chattanooga, and neither ever came back again. Uh, I would commend to you a book by uh, Leroy Phillips and uh, Mark Curden, uh, Contempt of Court, which describes this case and the historic work of, of these two lawyers who long forgotten, uh, but who really uh, answered uh, the call uh, 
uh, to stand up for justice in this particular case at enormous cost to them uh, personally. Um, the next part uh, uh, and, and accompanying this time of lynching uh, was convict leasing. I recommend a couple of uh, books on this to really get an in-depth uh, sense of how pervasive convict leasing was. Uh, two books here, Slavery by Another Name uh, and Worse Than Slavery. Uh, Worse Than Slavery is by David Oshinsky and Slavery by Another Name by Douglas uh, Blackman, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize. There's also a website uh, for Slavery by Another Name, which has a great deal of information in it, and, and I would recommend it. Uh, uh, this is about the practice that the criminal courts were engaged in uh, after the Civil War of leasing prisoners, almost all black prisoners, uh, leasing them to the plantations and the turpentine camps and the railroads and the coal mines around Birmingham, Alabama uh, to, uh, to do labor. And the reason it was worse than slavery is because when people had slaves, they at least had some interest in their property. Uh, the slave is property, but when you had convicts, you literally had people who were disposable. You could send the convicts in the mine, and if the mine collapsed and killed them all, you just simply uh, went to the sheriff and got some more. Uh, and uh, this uh, very brutal practice went on right up until the 1940s, after, uh, uh, up until World War II uh, in, in Alabama. Uh, convicts were moved from job to job in rolling cages, uh, not only was this the way they were moved from job to job, this was also their housing. This was in uh, Pitt County, North Carolina in um, uh, 1910. Uh, this is the living quarters of uh, convicts working in coal mines near uh, Birmingham, uh, Alabama. Uh, as David Oshinsky says uh, in his book, uh, convict leasing was designed for black, not white convicts. It was possible to send a Negro to prison on almost any pretext, but it was very difficult to get a white person there unless they had committed a very heinous crime. The law allowed whites to exploit blacks without legal limit, to withhold the most basic rights and safeguards while claiming to be indulgent, uh, paternalistic, uh, and fair. Uh, worse, it turned the criminal justice system into a corrupt and capricious entity utterly undeserving of respect. I mean, this is the criminal justice system uh, during uh, the 20th century. Uh, Dan Carter points out uh, in his book about Scottsboro uh, that Southerners discovered that lynching, uh, finally discovered that lynchings were untidy and created bad press. Uh, and they were increasingly replaced uh, by situations in which the Southern legal system uh, prostituted itself to what the mob demanded. Basically, would-be lynchers would just be told, let the law take its course. And the understanding there, of course, was that uh, the people would be arrested, uh, they'd give them a quick trial with just perfunctory representation before an all-male, all-white jury, and they'd be sentenced to death and promptly uh, executed. As he says, such proceedings uh, had all the essence uh, of uh, mob violence uh, shedding only its most outward form, the outright uh, violence that, that happened in those situations. Uh, this is the Scottsboro Boys, the Powell versus Alabama landmark Supreme Court case about the right to counsel for people facing the death penalty. Uh, these young men were tried in Scottsboro, Alabama in 1931, and the people of Scottsboro actually thought that they had done something positive here. They didn't lynch these young men who were charged uh, with the rape of two white women. Instead, they gave them a trial, not much of a trial, uh, trials that uh, started only a very short time uh, after the crime uh, that went very fast, that were dominated by mobs outside and inside the courthouse, uh, but trials nonetheless. Uh, and many people said, you know, if this had happened a few years ago, we would have just lynched these young men. So why isn't everybody satisfied? Well, of course, the answer being that the trials were a sham. Uh, and uh, the National Guard was there throughout the entire time protecting these young men. Uh, you can see the National Guard behind uh, the young men in this picture. Um, and, uh, but the Supreme Court record didn't have a great deal about the mobs outside the courtroom, didn't have a great deal, some about the National Guard because it's mentioned in the opinion. But what the court seized on was the appointment of the lawyers. Uh, in the case. That basically on the morning of trial there was no lawyer. 
the judge had earlier appointed all the members of the bar uh, to the case, and they all found some reason to get out of it, except for one, Milo Moody, who was an elderly sort of doddering uh, lawyer, somewhat senile, uh, according to Dan Carter's book on Scottsboro. Uh, and then Steve Roddy, a lawyer who came from Chattanooga at the behest of the families uh, of some of these people, but uh, as Carter also says, who fortified himself with alcohol uh, before dealing with a very unhappy uh, or very hostile to him uh, audience in the courtroom. Uh, and they basically decide on the morning of trial that they're going to try the case, and they try the cases in a series of trials in which the death penalty is imposed. The first jury goes out. It comes back with a death sentence. The second jury is hearing a case, and it hears the roar from the crowd uh, when the death penalty is imposed. Uh, the court says that uh, lawyers are necessary from the outset for a thoroughgoing investigation of the case, uh, and then in a capital case, lawyers must be provided. We'll see that lawyers are not provided in other uh, serious criminal cases in the states until 1963. Um, finally, I want to introduce uh, Gilbert King, who came uh, as a guest to class uh, to talk about uh, Jim Crow justice and to talk about Thurgood Marshall's role. Uh, in one particular case, a number of African Americans who were facing the death penalty in Groveland, uh, Florida in the 1940s, late 1940s. Uh, he does a marvelous job telling the story. Uh, in this book, this was much like the Scottsboro case. Uh, it was four young African-American men, two of them ultimately killed by the sheriff uh, or his posse, uh, but who were charged with rape uh, of a white woman. Uh, he is also the author of a book on the execution of Willie Francis, a man who was, at least Louisiana, tried to execute him one time and he was not killed. Uh, went to the Supreme Court, which allowed uh, Louisiana to try a second time, and the second time Willie Francis was executed. Uh, but we're very fortunate to have Gilbert King join us for our class uh, and to tell us some about his research and what went into the book uh, Devil in the Grove about Thurgood Marshall and the Groveland Boys. Thank you.